And if any of you are troubled, I encourage you to speak out, testify. I'm hoping you can pray for us. Um, we're soldiers home on leave, and my friends here are troubled. Cheever has a very bad back and a broken marriage, and he wants to take his own life. And TK is wounded in the private parts, which is why he's lying to his fiance about going to horse. That's a scene from the movie The Lucky Ones with Rachel McAdams, where she's seeking a spiritual healing, which is a topic we touch on with today's guest, the extraordinarily excellent Dr. Alexander Moreira Almeida, who is a world-class Brazilian doctor and expert on spirituality and health. He's an MD, university professor, researcher, And one of the big takeaway messages that he has is that even though we're conditioned to immediately apply the crazy tag to any connection between spirituality and health, the actual science leads us to the verified fact that there is a connection. Here's a clip. Sometimes, of course, there is the dark side of spirituality, but it's not the average. On average, the use of religion and spirituality is positive and have even impact on mortality. Just one example, Professor Tyler Van de Wiel, he's, a, he's a, a chair of public health at Harvard University, he's one of the best statisticians in the world nowadays. He has several studies following up 70,000, 80,000 people for 10, 15 years, and showing, for example, that the people who attended a religious service at least once a week died 50% less in a 40 years follow-up, or died six times less from suicide in this also 14 years follow-up. So there is a, a, a strong impact. But now I think the current challenge is first to disseminate this information to to general population and also in the training of physicians, of nurses, and psychologists, because sometimes this knowledge has not been translated yet in actual clinical training of professionals, of health professionals. And the second challenge, I think, perhaps is more even of interest to skeptical audience, is, uh, okay, but what is the meaning of spirituality, actually? So spirituality is, because, of course, we can understand, okay, uh, re- church attendance can be related to social support, can be related to beliefs, but does actually have an, any ontological reality, this spirituality? Is there something actually beyond matter? So I think these studies, for example, of spiritual experiences and try to understand the ultimate source of these spiritual experiences and the meaning of this experience to human nature, I think is one of the most interesting challenges things that we have nowadays. So this is obviously a very complicated issue. So it's good to know that it's being tackled by somebody who can handle the complexity. I mean, this is someone who actually earlier in his career researched a John of God, you know, the now exposed sex trafficker, rapist, cult leader, murderer, who was friends with Oprah Winfrey and Bill Clinton until an investigative reporter who later was suicided revealed that the whole thing was about sex traffic and other evils that we can only imagine. And that's something we get into a little bit in this interview, but imagine this worst of the worst John of God figure, you know, when you really go study him, you come back with reports of people being healed. So some people are being incredibly abused, but some people are being healed. You want to talk about complexity? There you go. This is important research, important forward-looking science, and I loved every minute of it. Hope you enjoy it as well. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sakaris, and today we welcome Dr. Alexander Moreira. This, folks, this ought to be a good one. Uh, Dr. Almeida is a recognized, around the world, world world-recognized leader in spirituality and health research, tons of academic clinical experience in psychiatry, psychotherapy as well as scientific research, MD, PhD in Brazil, postdoctoral in Duke, writes books with Dean Radin, Marilyn Schlitz, Alan Wallace, Andrew Newberg, and I only throw those names out there because those might be ones that you've 
heard on this show because we've interviewed all those folks. So this is really, really a very prominent and important figure in this field of the intersection of science, spirituality, and medicine. And it's really a terrific opportunity for us to have him join us today. Dr. Amada, thank you very much for being on Skeptico. Oh, Alexis, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure being here, talking to you and to the audience of Skeptical, and congratulations for the work that you have done at Skeptical. Well, that's very nice of you to say, but let's, uh, let's talk about your background a little bit. You're uh, a Brazilian, and I think from the beginning, from Jump Street, your bio sort of brings forward the kind of more full-flavored understanding that we might have of how these things do merge together, how spirituality and rational scientific inquiry, your bio is, is that story in a lot of ways, isn't it? Yeah, I, during my, when I was a medical student, I was since the beginning interested in clinical practice and seeing patients, but at the same time, I was interested in scientific research. And specifically, during my, I think it's second or third year of medical school, I got to know about uh, psychic surgeries. And I've read uh, some articles in newspapers and magazines uh, here in Brazil about this stuff, about all the controversy, about if they are fraud or not. Then I thought, oh, why instead of just the uh, making uh, suppositions about uh, this stuff. How, why don't anyone go there and study and analyze what is happening? So it was exactly what we did. We went there, we collected the material, the tissues that were allegedly removed from patients and we brought to the university to, to submit to analysis. So this is exactly the start of our academic interest in this field. Fantastic. That's the next level stuff. I really want to get in there. The the John of God. I mean, this puts a whole different flavor and we can take it in so many different directions. It's so much deeper. I think we have to start maybe even with just kind of the baseline interest. But what I really want to refer back to is even uh, your, your upbringing as a uh, as a child inside of a culture that has a very uh, rich and diverse spiritual and spiritualist kind of understanding of the world. Tell us about that, because I think we, you know, we hear about that, but then we don't really process it as, uh, you know, Americans in the United States, what that really means. Can you add some depth to that, what that meant growing up in that culture? Okay, yeah. Uh, here in Brazil, uh, officially, um, Catholicism is the most prevalent uh, religion in Brazil. But in addition to that, we have, of course, several different lines of Protestantism, Evangelicals, but also we have Spiritism, we have African Brazilian religions, and several other different traditions. And in Brazil, it's very frequent. People mixing different faiths, different religions, different practices. For example, there is an, a, a national survey showing that in Brazil, half of Catholics believe in reincarnation in Brazil. So the, this is this. And in my family background, I uh, was basically in Catholicism and Spiritism. So there was a mix of Catholicism and Spiritism. And also something of African Brazilian religions like Umbanda. And also something of Protestantism. So <laughs> it was exactly in this melting pot. I, when I was a child, I attended some mediumistic seances, both in African Brazilian religions and also in Spiritism. And also, uh, there is a strong emphasis in Spiritism, in putting together science and spirituality, in trying to, there is an uh, emphasis in trying to have a rational faith or some things like that. So, in some sense, it, uh, it, it touched me, the, the idea in trying to understand in a rational scientific view the spirituality. So, yeah, I think everything uh, of, of this uh, different uh, perspectives and environment uh, molded myself. 
Fantastic. So then when you do have this sense of this rational scientific and you're obviously super intelligent, so you want to explore that part of it. What is that like for you personally? And also, what do you feel because you are work with so many people internationally, other researchers and scholars? Do you think that transition, that blending that you were able to do was easier for you or was it just as difficult as it is for so many people in the West who then feel like they're at this crossroads where they either have to leave behind all these experiences that they feel are genuine, but yet in order to enter into this scientific rational world, they have to leave those behind. Was that at all a, a struggle for you or just kind of an easy transition? Okay. Well, uh, well, first of all, it's interesting to say that I myself do not have this anomalous experience. I don't see anything. I don't hear anything. I don't have this experience. I, I, but I, I'm deeply interested in, in this experience. And I know many people who have these sorts of experience. For this is one point. The second point now, it has been more than 25 years that I started doing this kind of research. In the beginning, I thought it was it would be much harder than it actually was. Uh, yes, I even here I've heard a lot, oh, you faced opposition, you should think about a different career or things like that. But actually, also since the beginning, I was very, very committed to a very rigorous investigation. I, I've always been very, very concerned about methodological rigor and, and also having a philosophical and historical understanding of science and uh, what actually makes science and what are the other stuff that are not necessarily science, but some ideological commitment or historical perspectives and things like that. So, but uh, the bottom line is, uh, of course, we had to, to struggle with several challenges, but actually it was much easier than I had thought. And also it was very interesting that, uh, for example, here in Brazil, I was surprised by many key figures in scientific community that despite not being openly interested in religion and spirituality, when they found out that, found, find out that someone like me was interested in pursuing a research on that, I received a lot of support, sometimes behind the scenes, sometimes more openly, but also I'm very, very grateful to many uh, leading researchers worldwide that were very, very kind and very, very supportive to me. So it's amazing how leading people in this field in many different countries have been supportive to myself and to my career building. You know, that's uh, that's super interesting to me because I've, I've interviewed so many folks that I, I do believe that your experience is maybe if not unique is unique to your culture i think brazil is more forward thinking more, more flexible more free uh to kind of move through those things i've talked to so many researchers in the united states and in the uk who it was much much more difficult and there was much more kind of hostility so it, great and, and that's great and it's good to know that that's possible but i did want to give folks more of a kind of concrete sense of the work that you do. So I've pulled up your Amazon page on the screen. And then in particular, here's a book, Spiritism and Mental Health. And I just wanted to run through the table of contents of this book, because I think it'll help people understand what I meant in terms of where you kind of fit in the world. So this is compiled and edited by uh, Dr. Emma Bragdon. And I'm not familiar with her, but she looks like she is a pretty impressive person. But she called upon you to write chapters, a brief overview of the philosophy and development of spiritism methodologies, the spiritist view of mental disorders, which we're going to talk about in a minute, fascinating, the relationship of mediumship and mental disorders, another topic that you're interested in, you didn't actually write that chapter, or I'm not sure if you contributed. Anyway, I just want people to know, you know, uh, then there's like, uh, where's Alan Wallace, who's been on the show, you know, uh, a science of understanding the mind, Alan Wallace, spiritual attachment and health. And then we have uh, Dean Radin and Marilyn Schlitz, Compassionate Intention as a Therapeutic Intervention by Partners of 
cancer patients. And again, I'm not going to go into each one of those topics. I just want people to get a sense as we kind of jump into your work of where you sit and that there is this body of work that's going on and, and you are right in the middle and a part of it of serious scientific research that's exploring this intersection of science and spirituality. So do you want to maybe comment on that in terms of just the landscape that we're in and how it's changed in the years that you've been at this and where you see it at currently? Okay. I think the first major step in the field of spirituality and health, spirituality and science, uh, it started in the 1980s, 1990s, uh, with some authors like Harold Carnegie and others who start performing large epidemiological studies showing that spirituality and religiosity is still very prevalent nowadays and that they actually have impact a significant impact on health. And uh, I think this is nowadays established knowledge. So uh, I think um, uh, it's basically common knowledge in medicine and psychology. Uh, for example, international psychiatric associations like the World Psychiatric Association, the American Psychiatric, the Indian, South American, South America, uh, South African, Brazilian, in Germany, United Kingdom, all these Psychiatric associations, for example, have sections on spirituality and psychiatry. So it's nowadays a knowledge that spirituality is now is still and probably will keep being a major aspect of human beings and that has a lot of impact on health. Let me just interject with a couple of points that I learned from a couple of your presentations that I found. Because what you said, you're saying in a very matter of fact way, but it does push against, I think, some public perceptions or misconceptions that people have. One is that religion and religiosity is still very, very strong across the world. And if anything, it's increasing. The number of people who identify as being part of some religious group is very high, 80% range. And as you point out, that trend is trending up because many times, especially in the United States, we get the impression that it's no, it's trending down and many people are less religious and less spiritual. And that's not really what the data says. But the other thing you're pointing to that again, sounds controversial, but when you just look at it like you're talking about from a super high level and you go survey people and you correlate their religiosity with their overall health, there's a correlation there that you're alluding to that religious people, even if we, don't try and attach an explanation to it, seem to be more healthy. And they seem to understand that there is some relationship between their spirituality and their health. So am, am I correct in, 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 that's what I pulled from your stuff. So is that correct? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, for example, the Pew Research Center, Pew Research Center is probably the best uh, think tank in in discussing about beliefs and behavior around the globe. So they have a international survey for 2015 showing that 84% of the world's population have a religious affiliation. And even among the 16% of the world population that do not have a religious affiliation, they usually have some sort of spirituality, belief in God, gods, spirits, whatever. And the trends are that uh, there will be a decrease in people, in non-affiliated people in the next decades. So this is uh, uh, well-established data nowadays. The point is usually this sort of data is not widespread through global media and things like that. This is one point. The second point is regarding exactly the impact of spirituality on health. Sometimes, of course, there is the dark side of spirituality, that it also can have uh, deleterious effects, but it's not the average. The, on average, the use of religion and spirituality is positive and have even impact on mortality. Just one example, Professor Tyler Van de Wiel, uh, he's a, a chair of public health at Harvard University, is one of the best statisticians in the world nowadays. He has several studies following up 70,000 
80,000 people for 10, 15 years and showing, for example, that the people who attended a religious service at least once a week died 50% less in a 40 years follow-up or died six times less from suicide in this also 14 years follow-up. So there is a, a, a strong impact. We don't know very well by now what are the mechanisms. We have some ideas about that. But the point is, is currently well understood that there is this impact, that we need to take this in account. And so I, I think this is one major change. Since the beginning, I started to investigate this topic. But now I think the current challenge is first, to disseminate this information to the general population and also in the training of physicians, of nurses and psychologists, because sometimes this knowledge has not been translated yet in actual clinical training of professionals, of health professionals. And for example, currently we are now working together with Professor John Petit from Harvard University in developing a curriculum for psychiatric training in psychiatry residents. So we're exactly testing this new curriculum. How could we insert the curriculum in spirituality to psychiatry residents? So this is one major challenge. And the second challenge, I think, perhaps is more even of interest to skeptical audience, is, uh, okay, but what is the meaning of spirituality, actually? Exactly. So spirituality is... Because, of course, we can understand, okay, uh, church attendance can be related to social support, can be related to beliefs, but does actually have an, any ontological reality, this is spirituality? Is there something actually beyond matter? So I think these studies, for example, of spiritual experiences and try to understand the ultimate source of these spiritual experiences and the meaning of this experience to human nature I think is one of the most interesting, challenging things that we have nowadays. Yes, but I really respect and admire the way you've built the argument right there, which is to start with the data and just pound people over the head with the data and say, now explain to me again why you're, why you're looking away, why you're insisting that this data is the exact opposite of what it comes through overwhelmingly again and again, please explain. That's what I hear you saying. And that is the, the first step. And you know, we could mirror that with another area of interest that I want you to talk about. One of your interest areas is on establishing evidence for the differentiation between mental disorders and spiritual experiences. And that has a real depth to it that I think will come as kind of a surprise to people because this isn't just like, oh my gosh, are, is everyone who's having a spiritual experience, are they crazy kind of thing? No, you've taken it a, a, a whole step further where it kind of reminds me of like the near-death experience research where they've said, okay, does it have this factor, this factor, this factor? Then maybe we should consider it as part of a mental disorder. And if it doesn't, then we have to put it into this other category that we're defining. Do you want to walk us through that research? It's fascinating. Yeah, uh, yeah. This is this was actually the the topic of my PhD dissertation in two thousand four. I investigated uh, one hundred fifteen spiritist mediums and tried to investigate the phenomenology of their experience and if and also the mental health of these mediums and try to figure out if they were psychotic, if they had mental disorders, and if not, what? how could we differentiate these non-pathological experiences from a psychotic or other mental disorder? Well, actually, it's interesting the story of that because my wife, she is a historian and she was doing a PhD also. And in her PhD, she was exactly investigating the psychiatric resistance regarding spiritism and other religions that foster spiritual experiences. Because not only in Brazil, it was very strong, this resistance, but also in Europe and in U.S., especially in the end of 19th century and for a large part of 20th century, 
this kind of trans experiences were considered a major cause of mental disorder or a symptom of mental disorder. Actually, there were some several some laws uh, forbidding the practice of these religions because they would be very harmful to public health. There is even an author in Brazil who call, who said that spiritism was the leading lead cause of madness in Brazil. So I, I was very interested when I started to read her study, and then I had the idea: Oh, why? Why not try to investigate nowadays what is actually the mental health of this medium? So we start doing this kind of investigation. So basically what we found in these studies, but in several other studies, that people having spiritual experiences, for example, in mediumship, but also other sorts of spiritual experiences, they have several experiences that are quite similar to psychotic experience, for example. They can hear voices, they can see things, they can have thought insertions, feel insertions that are usually related to schizophrenia or other, or other psychotic disorders. However, despite having high levels of these specific experiences, they usually had a very good level of mental health, very good function, very good social adjustment and things like that. So it became clear that uh, they did not have a higher prevalence of mental disorder, it, 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 we found that. And other, st other researchers have also found that. And what became, is, is becoming more and more clear nowadays is that uh, these, what we call positive psychotic symptoms, that are hearing things, uh, seeing things, are not a good criteria to, this, to, to detect the mental disorder. Because, for example, in a psychotic disorder, in addition to these positive psychotic symptoms, as we call in psychiatry, seeing things, hearing things, and so on and so forth, the, the psychotic patients also have cognitive disorganization. They have problems in their interaction with people. They have problems in, in their work, in their family affairs, and also in the social relationship, the abundant effect. They, they have several other symptoms that much more reliable to make this distinction. So we have moved uh, a long way in, 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 with other colleagues in this. We also have performed some neuroimaging investigation, functional neuroimaging studies, uh, analyzing the brain functioning during these trans experiences. And currently now, we are performing genetic study, exoma study. We are investigating 100 mediums in Brazil, more prominent mediums, and we are investigating the genetic expression and if there is some sort of uh, some group of genes that are more prevalent or more active in mediums compared to controls or compared to people with psychotic disorders but we don't have the results yet but we hope that in a few months we'll have some results see that's what makes this so interesting is there's so many layers to this that we have to explore. I mean, the first layer that you talked about from a historical perspective is, why did we ever fall for that simplistic kindergarten explanation that everyone who hears voices is hallucinating? I mean, we always had a sense from a cross-culture, cross-time, and just stories in our families that that wasn't true, that it wasn't, that that didn't always mean it, but we accepted it out of hand. So. I love when your research comes in and goes, well, wait, you know, well, just through good modern psychology, we can, we can determine the first thing, like you said, is someone distressed by hearing these voices. If they're having hallucinations and they're psychotic or they're experiencing schizophrenia, we know what that looks like. And it doesn't look very good for that person in terms of their stress level, in terms of how they socially function, in terms of how they function at work. Hey, we look over at this person, none of those things are happening. That is incredibly powerful. And I love the way you just went through it again in a very matter of fact way, but in a very methodological way, because it gets to this fundamental mind body problem which isn't really a problem, which has always been more or less obvious, but science has kind of done this end run on it about materialism and it can only be, you know, the, the mind is 100% a, a function of the brain. It, it kind of addresses that problem in a very direct way. But what is so fascinating, which is level three, is then you come back around and say, oh yeah, but we are looking at the biology of it too. 
we are looking at genetics because that might play a role in it too, which would then kind of turn the whole thing upside down. And our gut instinct, I think, is of course it has to be both. It can't be an either or thing because again, experientially, that's what we know. That's what we're observing. So what do you think about that whole package of the kind of busting through the materialism, but at the same time coming back and leaning on materialism in a way and saying, well, you weren't totally out to lunch. There might be something there. Yeah, I like very much Aristotle. Aristotle, when he said that virtue is the middle ground, is in the middle, is not in the extremes. <laughs> so usually when you have extremes degladiating, both are partially correct and both are partially wrong. And I more and more, even my clinical practice, and I do, I've emphasized it pretty much with my medical students, my psychiatry residents, and so on and so forth, that we are biopsychosocial spiritual beings. Say that again so people get and it. Biological, psycho, social, spiritual beings. So we have all this dimension working together, influencing each other. And if we take in consideration only one of these, or if we exclude any of these, we will have an incomplete perspective of human beings. It's not necessary to choose between this perspective. It's wrong doing that. We must take everything in consideration. Just to give an example, uh, even in that study that I said previously from the Harvard group about uh, church attendance and mortality, they found that uh, people who attend every week, uh, at least once a week, uh, religious service, they died 50% less. Controlling for social demographic and all other variables. But they found what would be some of the main mediators. They found that people who attended religious service, so that means a spiritual part, it impacted mortality by first, they had lower levels of cigarette smoking. So it impacts <laughs> some behavior and biology. They also had higher levels of social integration, so the social aspect. And they had higher levels of optimism and lower levels of depression. So we have here this, the spiritual factor impacting the biological, the social, and also the psychological aspect. So it's impossible to, to distinguish, to separate all this stuff. So we definitely, uh, we don't need, because I think this is a very important point, Alex. When people quite often, I try to emphasize the spiritual aspect. They deny the psychological or the biological aspects. For example, even the importance of spirituality, to, we don't need to deny the importance of psychiatric medications. I'm a psychiatrist. I prescribe psychiatric medicines. Of course, they are very, very useful when well used. Of course. I don't need to deny this to to talk about the importance of, of spirituality. And the same thing, when I'm saying that many people who hear voice are not psychotic, it does not mean that everything who hears voice is mentally health. That's not the case also. So we don't need to fall in this trap, making, be forced to make choices. Or do you, be, do you have faith or reason? Do you believe in spirituality or in, in science or whatever? Why? I, I don't need that. Uh, we need to be very careful to not, uh, because it, it's, uh, it's very dangerous and there is the, the temptation to, to go the easy way to just choose one side of the dispute. I, I think, yeah, I think that's the major point. That's, that's excellent. Very, very well said. I wanted to pivot a little bit and do in skeptical fashion, poke a little bit at the problems that do come up. So from another one of your presentations, what do religion and spirituality mean is the slide I picked, I pulled up. Uh, I have a little bit of, little bit of resistance to some of this. Spirituality you define as the relationship or contact with a transcendent realm of reality that is considered sacred, the ultimate truth or reality. So you have already given us such a broad enriched view of how we need to look at some of these issues and at the same time we do need to pin down these definitions but it seems like every time we pin them down we create more problems 
what does transcendent mean from a philosophical perspective of idealism versus materialism, right? What would we really be transcending? Is everything that is material, including our body and our health and our spirituality, somehow emerging from a consciousness that we don't completely understand? Are we looking at it backwards when we think about transcending? I'm sure this is something you've thought about, as well as the sacred. What are we saying about the hierarchy of consciousness, about the order of this consciousness that we don't, can't even pretend to fully understand that there is some sacredness? What would that mean? There is some ultimate truth or ultimate reality. Again, these become very tricky words. I appreciate the need to have some kind of ground, some ground that we start with, but aren't we also have problems with with any kind of definition that we try and land on yeah i completely agree <laughs> uh, actually in in science as a whole we need definitions of course because definitions help us to make distinctions to help to say what we are talking about and, and also to label things to, to to make distinctions and comparisons and uh, but uh, we don't have good definitions for matter, for life, for many things that are really uh, essential, even in, in uh, physical, regular science. Science, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even definition of science. What is science? So definition of science, definition of matter. Yeah, we're we going to measure things of outside of us. Uh, I mean, that's uh, already uh, possibly uh, a major uh, misstep. Yeah. So, yeah. So yeah, so but it does, it does not mean that we should not strive to try to find some sort of definition that people, in some way, could grasp the the, the, the idea that, that we are talking about. So and specifically also because we are doing with the research. So I, I work a lot, as you you have said, with the research and mental health research and things like that. And for example, we, we need to have some important definitions. For example, when we are talking about spirituality, the, the importance of spirituality or, or the impact of spirituality, of the prevalence of spirituality, we need to try to, in some sense, to restrict it to some concept, to, to make it, to distinguish, for example, what is spirituality and what political ideology or what are ecological commitment, whatever. So, uh, so how can we distinguish that? So based in many different authors from different perspectives, we, we have a book that we will release this August by Oxford University Press, that is Spirituality and Mental Health Across Cultures. And we have at this book. And in, in this book, we have a, a first chapter exactly where we discuss the concept of spirituality and also took in consideration, very different authors from psychology, psychiatry, anthropology, history, and there is kind of a kind of consensus that spirituality has to do with this transcendental aspect of reality. And also, if we, for example, uh, uh, because I think a good concept should, of course, uh, be uh, accepted by key leaders in the field, but also, and most important, must reflect what actually happens in the real world. So if we take a look at the most prevalent spiritual traditions around the globe, Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Islamism, Christianity, and even uh, more uh, uh, indigenous traditions, but basically all of them, has or talks about about some transcendental aspect of life of the universe there are spiritual beings there are god gods ancestors whatever so it, it's uh edward tyler in the beginning uh, uh in the 19th century the beginning of anthropology of religion he said oh could be that there could be a religion without god but there is not religion without spirit in some sense so uh, if, if you understand the spirit or in this transcendental aspect of reality, some entities uh, or realm that goes beyond this material world that we have. So I think this, I, I mean transcendent in this sense, in this something else beyond 
this material world that we have. So it seems that basically all spiritual traditions share this. This is one common core of basically all spiritual traditions. And another very important point, if we take a look at this, all these spiritual traditions, they say that there is in some way some transcendental aspect of reality or of human beings. And this transcendental aspect is the ultimate reality, is the what really in, in, uh, what really matters the most. So because of that, it is sacred. So these are the two main reasons why we have emphasized the transcendental and the sacred. And of course, based on these experiences of spirituality, of a transcendental sacred, people share beliefs, practices in a community. This community is a religion. So this is basically the idea. Of course, the, the, we can raise issues about this definition, but I think it, it's quite broad to include the major, not major, but almost all spiritual traditions that we are aware of. But at the same time, it distinguishes, for example, from other aspects of secular life. Because, for example, there are several scales of spirituality using psychology and medicine. In, in the end, they quite often they defi define spirituality as well, as well-being, meaning life, sense of purpose. I think that meaning life, sense of purpose, and peace could be outcomes of spirituality, but it's not the same thing. Because, for example, if I'm a Marxist, I can find that my meaning of life in the struggle, in the class uh, struggle, and things like that, but probably it's not necessarily spirituality. And some probably the Marxist will feel upset in being called a spiritual person. So I, I, I think it's it's important to have uh, some borders that could differentiate spirituality from other aspects of life, although they very often ha have connections. I think that's wonderfully, wonderfully important. And uh, so, you know, if I get together with a group down at the beach to save the whales or to clean up the beach and make our environment better, and I tell people that that to me is my spirituality, you might come along and say, well, okay, I'm not arguing against your understanding of it, but that doesn't fit this definition for how I'm going to use it in this research. And I think it's very valuable for you to make that kind of distinction because so many times in our culture, we seem to be completely inept or unwilling to just make some kind of common sense distinctions in the same way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you you summarize very, very well. Yeah, it's exactly. Of course, people can call whatever they want to what they live. But when we're talking science, we need to have a more precise definition and some boundaries to, to help us to make analysis, even to compare, for example, yes. uh, if, if, uh, if, if an involvement in a more secular community, like uh, environmental issues or political issues, has the same impact or not for a more spiritual uh, based uh, community. Even to ask this kind of questions, we need to have clear definitions. Awesome. Okay, so now I'm going to pivot again with another, I think, kind of tough question. And, and you're going to, I can't wait to hear what you have to say about this, because you are so honest, and you're so brave. I mean, you haven't been, I guess the system hasn't worn you down enough yet, or <laughs> you, you've, you've, you've transcended the system in a way. But, you know, one of the ideas that we've explored on this site, on this show, is that a lot of people who wind up in doing this kind of work, and especially pushing against materialism and pointing out that we are already in a post-materialist world. If you really look at the cutting edge science, it has all, it's been post-materialistic for the longest time, but we can't seem to get past that dogma. But a lot of times th there's a leaning towards the argument that science needs spirituality in order to explain the world or science needs spirituality to become complete. And I always want to say, that may be true, but I think we we just in the in the in the interest of really exploring all possibilities, we have to explore the counter hypothesis, and that is that shit science is doing everything it can to keep spirituality out of the game, to keep spirituality especially out of the science business. Spirituality is is in some ways 
a threat to the business of science. And if even if even if some people in your community and some people who are fair minded don't see it that way, we can easily imagine other factors and forces that would see it as a threat. And uh, do you have any thoughts on on that and kind of a more parapolitical understanding of the tension between science and spirituality? Yes, actually, I've been interested in this subject a lot for, for many years. First of all, this idea of unnecessary clash, unnecessary conflict, operational conflict between science and religion, spirituality, is, uh, first of all, it's a myth. It's common knowledge nowadays in history of science. No serious historian of science nowadays accepts that. So uh, uh, it accepts that it, just so we understand each other, accepts the idea that, well, science couldn't move forward if we ever considered any of the stuff you're talking about. Well, we'd just all collapse. And that's what you're saying is a myth, right? What I'm saying is the idea that uh, science necessarily denies religion and religion necessarily is in opposition to science. Sometimes we, we, we've learned this in school or even in the university or in science um, promotion. Actually, it's not true. Okay, there's a myth that there is a perennial conflict between science and religion. This is nowadays, it's common knowledge in history of science. Actually, if we see throughout history, at least in the Western world, at least since the ancient Greece, there has been a strong connection between spirituality and science and philosophy and reasoning and things like that. If we take, for example, in consideration, Pythagoras, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and since then, there is a strong connection between uh, spiritual issues and religion and, and, and science. And even the scientific revolution in 16th century with Galileo, Kepler, Robert Boyle, Francis Bacon, all of them actually were spiritually committed people. And also what is even more uh, surprising for many people, it was surprised me when I learned this for the first time, they they were spiritually motivated to do science. Actually, they, they, they thought that they were reading the book of nature, the book of nature that was written by God. So if we understand the creation, we have a better understanding of the creator. So understanding the creation would be the best way to glorify God. It, this is the word of Francis Bacon, for example. So they were spiritually motivated people, Isaac Newton and so on and so forth. So actually, this prevalent view in the academic environment of a necessary opposition between science and spirituality is an exception, basically from the 20th century. From the end, if we take a large historical perspective, it started in the end of 19th century and endured, and, and endured until the end of 20th century. So nowadays, it's not more. So the best universities in the world, Harvard, Cambridge, Oxford, all of them have departments of science and religion discussing the possibilities of integration. So the first point is in this historical perspective, this idea of conflict is a historical short period that, uh, is, that, that it has gone. But on the other side, of course, I don't think that is the same thing, spirituality and science, and then necess not necessarily we need to, to make science spiritual, so on and so forth. I think there is a space for spiritual life, there is a space for scientific life. So the, uh, they are not, they have contacts, but they are not the same thing. Actually, my now you are more <laughs> kind of philosophical thinking. I think we have basically three major ways to grasp reality through art, to spirituality, and to science, through science. I think these are three different and complementary ways to grasp reality. Of course, they have uh, points of contact, but sometimes they don't have. So this is one point. As true scientists, we, we should be open 
to understand, to study and understand with open mind all sorts of things that happens in nature. So all sorts of human experience, everything that happens should be of interest to, to, to a scientist. So we need to take in consideration all sorts of experience, including spiritual experiences. And we also should be open to, to have all sorts of explanations for this experience. For example, if we are, we are studying near death experience, of course, we should take in consideration the possibilities, just the brain hypoxia causing that. We should take in consideration that just the psychological aspects like fear of death. We should take consideration that cultural aspects are explaining. But we also should be allowed to think that perhaps biopsychosocial aspects are not enough to explain everything without a residual. So we should be allowed to think the possibility, for example, that um, sign a kind of non-material consciousness could be part of this. So, and in this uh, non-material consciousness would be not a supernatural, because I claim with many others for expanded naturalism. So we think that nature is everything that exists. And nature may be something beyond that. There may be constitute not only from matter, physical force and particles, but perhaps consciousness is another irreducible aspect of nature. You should be open to investigate that. But of course, I respect those who think, no, no, we think that everything should be explained by biopsychosocial aspects. That's fine. They should work on their paradigm. They should work on, on, on this theory and try to explain everything. But, of, but on the other side, it should be allowed that other paradigm candidates work. And there is a philosopher of science in Helakatus that calls there should be a Darwinian competition of research programs. And the, the better programs will prevail. So I think that's the point. We should be truly open, but at the same time, very rigorous in investigation, investigating these different possibilities. You know, that's wonderful. And I love the way you've kind of laid out the path forward. And you're even suggesting that you see definite movement on that path. Certainly the way you framed it in terms of the uh, bio, psycho, social, spiritual, you know, all those elements being together. I guess what I'm trying to do is add another element to that. And that is in the social aspect, we have the political and in particular the parapolitical. And the example that I always use is Project Stargate, you know, the famous remote viewing project at Stanford Research Institute, some of the most successful parapsychology experiments in history, and Russell Targ and Hal Putoff, you know, they did publish those two in peer-reviewed journals. But there was a parapolitical aspect of that that I think is an overlay on this thing. And by that, I mean, they were way past materialism. <laughs> They presupposed that they were operating in the extended realm. They weren't sitting there wringing their hands going, oh, gosh, gee, are these things going to work? They already proved that they work. They had Ari Geller in, and he proved that they work. And then they had, you know, Joe McMonagle come in, and he could do it. And they, so they were off to the races. And now it's like, go find that Russian sub. Go do this. Go do that. But from a parapolitical standpoint, the message was very different. You know, there was this invisible college that I think is still in existence of let's not let's not move the move the needle too far in that direction. Let's not don't go too fast. You know, and I don't know who the guys at Harvard you're referring to, but there's a bunch of other guys at Harvard who are not going in that direction and maybe are being told to, you know, hey, just take the pedal off the gas there. I think that's in play. I think it's always in play. And I think it plays a much bigger role in this stuff than we're willing to sometimes acknowledge. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. I think that the social and political aspects of science are extremely important. And uh, that is because of this, I think we should work in three different uh, levels, and we are trying exactly doing this. The first is producing better data. This is one point. The second is to address some 
philosophical and historical misconceptions about science and about spirituality. I think this is the key issue because do, usually during our scientific training, during our education, most of us were taught that religion or spirituality is something bad, something from the past, something of superstition is has been proved that the brain generates mind there's something beyond that is just so we we learn that we we, we uh, sometimes we accept that and uh, so i think one major aspect is exactly to show the inconsistency and problems of these assumptions these misguided assumptions as I, as i said for example Several examples of misguided uh, presuppositions. First, science and religion has been always in opposition. Second, uh, science has proved that there is only matter in the world. Third, everything non-material means superstition, means back to the dark ages. And so all this stuff, these are very strong ideas. So we need first to tackle the, these misconceptions because if we don't address these misconceptions, people e don't even take a look at the evidence because they know in advance that it is impossible. It's not only possible, but it's extremely harmful because it has always causing harm throughout history. So we were only to, to, to flourish when we were able to remove all this terrible superstition idea. So, of course, I, I, I'm being ironic and, and, and simp make a simplification, but this mindset, it, it, I think, is it is the major problem. So when we show that these misconceptions does not stand through a good philosophical analysis, a good historical analysis, and if we uh, disseminate this knowledge uh, through general audience, of course, uh, to general audience, but also in the new training scientists, the new training clinicians, if we were able to teach them since the beginning that is not true necessarily, that uh, it will be very, very important. So this is one, uh, just another example. Uh, uh, a PhD student of mine, we made a national survey with 4,000 psychologists in Brazil. And one question is, do you think that spirituality impacts health? That was the question. Nowadays, it's established knowledge. There are literally thousands of studies showing that. Do you do believe that the, the psychologists with the higher training, with PhD and postdoc, they had lower levels of endorsing this statement? So the scientific training created anti-scientific beliefs denying the, the scientific evidence that spirituality impacts health. So this is very, very alarming, how our scientific training is generating anti-scientific beliefs, claiming having defending science. So the two points, first is to, to address these misconceptions. Second is to uh, generate more evidence. And the third, I think it's very important, but we have not worked a lot on this, is developing some paradigm candidates, develop some theories that could make sense of everything. Like, for example, like Frederick Myers with his subliminal mind and other authors who proposed some kind of theories or paradigm candidates to explain the whole thing. For example, Thomas Kuhn, instructor of scientific revolutions, showed that people would never abandon a previous paradigm if they don't have another one, a better one. So it's not only enough to show anomalies in the old paradigm. It's important to show a new and better paradigm. I think that's absolutely brilliant, wonderful. And I, I you know, what the first, first thing that pops into my mind is part of the conditioning is this idea that philosophy is dead, right? And, uh, right, that's Stephen Hawking's famous thing. And it's, as you kind of so beautifully point out, it is really the opposite of that is true, is that philosophy always has to be the starting point to a certain extent. Even if we take the philosophy of science, which you've 
so eloquently kind of laid out how these issues are philosophy of science questions, not just ruminating about the world, but about practically how we would do this. And then I love that you were, you were remaining grounded in the data, in the method. Hey folks, we still do have this scientific method and you know what? It's a tool that can still be applied and still move us forward. So that's all wonderful. So now we got to move to the darkness. <laughs> and at the beginning of the show, you did allude to some of the work you've done with psychic surgery, uh, the John of God thing, which collects international headlines, and it should. It challenges us in so many ways about the, the dark side of spirituality and even the dark side of uh, the social aspect of it, that we do need this sense of community. We are all susceptible to the cult kind of thing because it's baked into who we are. It's not like a bad thing. It's like, hey, we wanna be around together and we want at the wedding or it's a funeral, we all wanna to get together and da, da, da. And people who find a way to turn that against us can gain great power. And then add to the fact that they may be tapping into an extended realm that also might at times be aligned with some malevolent kind of aspects of whatever this extended nature is. And we have all the things that we see in John of God, the worst of the worst, rapist, murderer, ran camps where he would force these women to have children and then he'd kill them afterwards and sell the babies. The worst of the worst, and even what's reported is often still sanitized a little bit. But here's the spin on it that I think is so important. When you went there, I mean, first you have to tell us, you know, you went there because for 40 years, this guy was just regarded as getting results. And you go there and you find that he does sometimes get some results. You don't go there and say, this never, nothing ever happened. You go there and come back and go, well, it's kind of a mixed bag, but yeah, there are some people that later report of having a positive result. And you, I'm sure, had no way of knowing all the other stuff that was going on like so many other people in the world didn't. But there's so many layers to this. Where do you even want to start? Maybe start with telling us specifically what was your experience? What was your reason for going there? What year it was? And then what happened as this thing unfolded? Okay. I think that, uh, of course, all sorts of ideas and even of good concepts could be misused. Science is a big example. The, the Nazism was a big misuse of science. The, uh, the Darwinism was misused to support racism and things like that. So, yeah, millions of people were killed based on misguided use of science, for example. We can misuse the idea of justice and then we behead people in the name of injustice and things like that. So I think that spirituality religion is the same. Of course, it can do much harm if it is misused. I think that's the point. It's like any other major force in human's life. Hold but on, because that's just... You, now, let's make sure we're talking... Because sometimes we talk about this stuff and we don't really nail it down. You are primarily, I would say exclusively, talking about the social aspect of it. And maybe you could spread that out to the biopsycho part that you're talking about. But there is evidence, if you're willing to let some of it in, that there is a spiritual part of this that is negative, that is dark, that is evil, that is all those things that, and this is widely reported, right? I mean, we don't have to dance around this. So that kind of brings a whole different flavor to that. You know, was John of God being demonically controlled to kind of go way out there on the edge? We don't know, but doesn't that have to be on the table as well as all the other things you're talking about? Yeah, I think so. I think that uh, uh, all spiritual traditions talk about some kind of negative spiritual force, and I think this should be also discussed. And specific, specifically about John of God, we performed a study with him in 95, 26 years ago, 
we went there. I was a medical student. We went there. We interviewed people before and after the surgeries. We followed up the surgeries. We filmed the surgeries. We took the tissues that he claimed to have removed from patients. Actually, he removed these tissues from patients. And uh, so we found out that actually he didn't use any anesthetic procedures that we were able to detect. And antiseptic procedures, they pay, most of patients did not re report any pain, despite being cut with kitchen knives quite often. And the tissues that he removed were compatible with the, the places from where they were removed. But most of these tissues were not pathological ones. For example, he, he removed from health tissues for, from these different places. And also, he, it was clear that he performed a very dramatic and quite strong way during his surgeries. We report everything that is in, in a paper published by the Brazilian Medical Association. And also later, we published with Stanley Krippner a version at Journal of Shamanic Praxis, an English version of this paper. At that time, we have never heard about these accusations of sexual problems and things like that. But anyway, we, but since then, I was not directly focused in study of healing and psychic surgeries anymore. I took a different path in my career, investigating more spiritual experiences, mental health and mind-brain connections. Although I think it's very important to the study of healing, spiritual healing, and things like that. And even here in Brazil, we have recently a discussion about uh, mediums who claim to, re to receive letters from deceased. And there is a big claim that some of them are actually fraudulent, taking information from internet, for social media, and things like that. So, of course, we, we need to be aware of all of this fraud and misuse of spirituality to have control and other evil uses of religion, we need to be aware of this. It's, it's, it's not new. For example, if we go to the Gospels, we can see that the people uh, who Jesus blamed the most or, or was more had more strong words to say to were exactly the religious people who misused their religious power. So the misuse of religious power is definitely a big issue that needs to be taken into consideration. Right. I'm just going to poke at this a little bit more because I'm very interested in this topic of evil, not because I want to stare into the abyss, but because I want to point out how inept we've allowed ourselves to be in dealing with this. And, you know, you mentioned the forced choice thing, and I think that's where we're at here. With evil, we're forced into either this very rigid kindergarten atheistic, well, that can't possibly be true understanding, or we're forced into, oh, here it is, it's in this book. I'll bring out the gospel, I'll bring out the Quran, I'll bring out whatever, and my book will tell us all we need to know. Where you're going ultimately, I think, you know, in, in terms of actually developing some kind of uh, advanced understanding of these extended consciousness realms and the light and the dark and the good and the evil as it exists, as it influences us, is what we really want on some level. And it's really the only way, intuitively, we know that's the only way to explain Jhana God. Jhana God isn't just ripping people off. There's something darker going on. Those Catholic priests that abuse at a systematic level, all those children, all those families in Brazil, some of the highest rates in the world. And yet, you know, the Catholic Church isn't out of business in Brazil. They're not out of business any place in the world. They're allowed to go on, and it's clearly an institutional level problem. If it was any normal organization, they'd just shut it down. Our intuitive sense is there is something more to that that isn't just biopsycho. It's spiritual. And how do we get there? How, it, first of all, maybe you don't agree with that, but if you do agree with it, how do we get there? It's a very, very d tricky and touchy subject to, to really full on contemplate what that evil is without just doing a drive-by, stare into it, watch a Netflix, be, ooh, how scary. Just say, what is really going on there? I, I don't know if I have a good answer to, to your 
very in interesting, challenging questions. Yeah, I think all of us have our angels and demons inside us, and we need to be very careful to which of them we will feed. And, uh, and it's even worse because we know that some of the worst things done in, in history were done in the name of good in some sense. Uh, of course, usually people don't say, okay, I'm doing bad, very bad things. I will uh, uh, recruit people to do bad things. Of course, it does not work like that. We say, oh, we are renewing the world. We are changing. For example, the Maoism in China with this cultural revolution, the idea was exactly, oh, we are renewing everything because the old people were bad. Let, let's do this and then let, let's kill millions. So uh, like the Nazism and like the religious wars and things like that. So I think we need to be very careful about the self-deception, about the rationalizing our evil aspect of ourselves. So, uh, so we need to be very careful about that, we need to be very careful about the means that we use to, to some end. I think this is essential also to keep this in mind. And also, I think that a, a, a good cultivation of a healthy spiritual life that try really to, to use uh, good spiritual reading, meditation, prayer, contact with diff diverse people to be open to criticism, to talk to other people in different perspectives and uh, genuinely uh, search for the truth and for the, for the light. I, I think, yeah, I think... It, <laughs> I, I understand your hesitancy because when we really want to talk about our, our own personal spirituality, it's difficult. And you are playing such an important role in trying to keep your feet on, on, on solid ground on both counts. And I so respect that. And we so need that. And you're so brilliant at the way that you do it. To whatever extent you feel you can, explain to us how you understand your personal spirituality because what you just hinted at is essentially where i wind up at the end of the day which is that the secret of the ascent is to always look up and the light is really infinitely more powerful than the dark and it's really not that hard to even distinguish between the true i mean we kind of have it wired into us you know what's the right thing and even if we can't choose it all the time it's it's a choice that we that we can make and we can kind of see where that leads. It's just not that complicated. But I just share that because I, I don't want to just grill you all the time and not say anything. So to whatever extent you feel you can share your personal understanding of uh, spirituality. As I told you previously, I grew up in a spiritist and Catholic background. And I've become more and more interested in perennial philosophy, in, in seeing how different spiritual traditions throughout history are different angles to understand the transcendent, the spirituality. Usually each different tradition emphasized more one aspect of spirituality but we we can learn a lot from all these perspectives so my my personal view my personal spiritual view is that yeah we are spiritual beings that uh, we are in a journey that is something beyond uh, matter and we are in, in, in a journey towards towards God or whatever the name we, we, we call this. And there is kind of a harmony and uh, in the universe that is sustained by this higher being. And, uh, and the different religious traditions are different angles that people can see aspects of this ultimate reality. And these religions not are only different angles, but also molded by the capacities and culture or, and people from these different perspectives. And I truly believe that we are, I, I don't see any distinction between 
any people from anywhere. I think we are in the same journey. We need to help each other in going to to our higher, to what we are dest- destined to be. I think that's the the main idea. And I think, as I said previously, I think the art, spirituality, and science are the two key ways to grasp this reality. And I'm very interested nowadays, for example, in understanding spiritual motivations in art. And also uh, there is a strong connection also in major artists since Mozart, Beethoven. So I think that is a huge interconnection between these different aspects of human life and the connection with the ultimate reality. I think that's wonderful. And uh, I appreciate that. And you've certainly given us such a more encouraging, broader view of how we might imagine our own spiritual journey. And it's just terrific. And it's so appreciated. So in a little bit of time we have left, Dr. Amita, what are you working on now? What has caught you? You've talked a little bit about the topics that you're interested in. How do people follow what you're doing and and, and keep up with your work? Well, uh, well, currently, we are performing some studies in spiritual experiences. Specifically, we are performing two national surveys, one in people who claim previous life and another in people who have a near-death experience here in Brazil. So we are collecting reports from these people. Uh, these are two studies. We are also performing a study nowadays with mediums who claim to receive messages from the people we are investigating the accuracy of the information that they produce. We are also working with end-of-life experience patients in hospices, in, in palliative care units, and we are investigating their spiritual experiences. We are also investigating more in a historical perspective how the SPR, the Society for Psycho Research, the major minds in the, pre- the first decades of SPR, how they dealt with survival research specifically regarding theory and methodological challenges end of a 19th century beginning a 20th century kind of time frame yeah until 1920 yeah and also we have a phd student who is investigating also philosophers from 19th and 20th century and how they did discuss uh, the possibility of empirical evidence for survival of consciousness and which kind of evidence it would it be. So these are some sorts of investigation that we are performing. And people who are interested in being in touch with us, we have a YouTube channel, TV Nupis. Nupis is the name of our research group. It's a bilingual, bilingual channel, uh, Portuguese and English. So TV Nupes, N-U-P-E-S. So you, you search it, you will find hundreds of videos from different perspectives from different authors around the globe. So we have also our social media in what's in Instagram and Facebook. And uh, this August, we are publishing a book at Oxford University Press that is, we are very proud of this book because, because we have more than 30 leading authors from eight different countries discussing the practical implications of spirituality to mental health. It can be found at Amazon uh, at their webpage that you, you showed previously. And can you can you give people the the title of that book? Uh, Spirituality and mental health across cultures. We are very very proud of this book because it's it has the top authors in the world from different perspectives in spirituality and mental health. So I, I think it's a very very uh, good introduction and summary to the practical aspects. And there is also this other book from Springer, Exploring the Frontiers of Mind-Brain Relationship, that we published a few years ago, that discusses more the mind-brain issue, the spiritual experiences, and this uh, questioning aspects regarding materialism. I think this is also another possibility. I have to ask this because people are going to ask me. This book is in Oxford University Press. It's going to come out. It's $70 in the U.S. A lot of people aren't going to fork over that money or sometimes they come out with a, a Kindle version later or a yeah. version that's more more affordable. Is that a possibility? No, it, it definitely. There will be a Kindle version, a paperback, 
And uh, also we ask then that uh, some parts of the book will be openly access, will be f open access for, for some months. So this is good news. And this, this book in the middle, this blue one, Exploring Frontiers of Mind Brain Relationship, is a one that tackles, tackles more on the mind brain issue in no materialist perspective, in the in-depth analysis of different spiritual experience. It has chapters from Andrew Newberg, Mario Borregar, Bruce Gray, so, so many of the key authors in the field. So uh, I think it's a, it's a good uh, uh, overview also of this, this field. And also another aspect, another new, a good news, is that uh, this year, our research group here in Brazil, we are celebrating 15 years of our research group, NUPIS at Federal University of Juiz de Fora. And on September 11th, we will have an online meeting, bilingual Portuguese and English also, uh, discussing the present and future of science and spirituality. We will have also some of the best authors in the field. We will have Harold the Koenig and Park Ken Pargament uh, in, in, history, in, in psychology and medicine. We will have uh, Axel Cardenham and Robert Cloninger discussing consciousness. Uh, how spiritual experience can help us to understand consciousness. We also have uh, Ronald Numbers, one of the best historians of science nowadays, who published at the Harvard University Press book, Galileo Goes to Jail and Other Myths in Religion Science, a very, very uh, interesting author on this. And also we will have Andrew Pinsent, who is Catholic priest, physicist, and director of research of the Center for Religion and Spirituality for Oxford University Press. So we have very different authors from different perspectives taking a uh, participating of this online symposium in September 11th. So you will find more information about this also in my uh, social media, in website or other aspects. Thank you very much. Thank you. So our guest again has been the quite amazing Dr. Alexander Moreira Almeida. And uh, please get out and support this research. You can see how important this is. This is a path forward. You know, a lot of times we talk about some of the work that's being done, and it's hard to really see how it could change things, how there really might be a path forward. And I have to say, this guy has not only painted the path forward, but he's grabbed the sword, hopped on his horse, and he's leading the charge forward. He's a light bringer, and that's, that's wonderful. And he's obviously a man of science and a learned man of reason. It's been absolutely terrific connecting with you, and I appreciate so much the time. Alex, thank you very much. I'm, uh, I thank you very much for so kind words that you, you have said about our work. And really, I truly appreciate your work at Skeptical. I, for many years, I follow up your, your work and I congratulate you. And I think exactly works like you are an essential aspect that, from that strategy that I said previously about disseminating the knowledge, this, deconstructing these misguided assumptions and spread the word about the good new research. Congratulations. Thanks again to Dr. Alexander Moreira Almeida for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I tee up from this interview is, is this fight winnable? We're in the middle of some very interesting times when it comes to world health. Is this really a path forward? Or are there other forces in play that would make such advances impossible? Love to hear your thoughts. Come out over to the Skeptico Forum or drop me an email. Find me any way you can. Love to hear from you. Lots more to come. Until next time, take care and bye for now.